two are free. Uh, we have maybe uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes for talk, for questions at the end, but let us know, yeah. you know, what, what yeah, of how are you doing? So uh, everybody, uh, welcome to this uh, uh, extraordinary opportunity to hear uh, the Anna Holtrup, who whose work has just sort of exploded. Uh, I think in the States in particular, I, I, I'm aware that in Europe and other parts of the world, your work was more well known than it's suddenly become in the United States. I mean, there's a couple of reasons for that, I think, as you'll see right away. One is that this kind of remarkable mix material ex uh, experimentation and material to constructional ex experimentation that we talk a lot about in the States, but never seems to happen. Although it seems to happen in other places in the world, the kind of radical consequences of that are pretty astonishing in Anna's work. The second is where a lot of the work is being done, which is Bahrain, which is, you know, it's just off of our radar screen. It really is, it, it, it's really quite astonishing. I remember at first seeing the buildings going, these are where? They're, they're where and how? And then, so I think that's its own uh, fascinating story. So uh, uh, with no further ado, I think the work's gonna speak for itself. We're thrilled to have you here, Anna. Uh, thank you so much. And with no further ado, let's get this uh, rolling. And uh, if, you were, if you were in person here, as in Mexico, you would hear applause. Now you're just gonna hear silence but you're going to see hands moving, uh, at least here. So uh, let's get this rolling. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, David, for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me share the screen. Uh, here we are. Share. Up. Yeah, this is visible. Huh? Totally. Um, well. Yeah, yeah. So I, I prepared um, a, a talk for this evening um, to, to explain, let's say, the, the, the motivations behind the work and the process of, um, of working, the way how, um, um, how, how we develop uh, the work. And it resolves around um, three key uh, understandings, the site, matter and gesture um, that are quite interrelated uh, as, as you will see in the, in the talk. Um, I thought, oh, let me get, yeah, here we are. I thought I start with what I do in the, as a professor of architecture at the ETH in Zurich in Switzerland, where I've been teaching now for a couple of years uh, what, we, what we started uh, as a studio uh, called uh, material gesture, uh, and we have added a site to that understanding as well. And here you see one of the studio outcomes. This was a, a semester on uh, textile. And what we do in material gesture is, let's say, um, to de we develop the architecture solely from um, a material investigation. And um, the techniques of working a material, the techniques of sourcing material, the te techniques, let's say, of um, um, working with a material, um, and that this informs um, basically everything of the architecture. So the, it, its form, its way, how it is constructed, etc. So there is not so much of another assignment in it, besides that we have, let's say, each uh, semester uh, um, a topic, a, a kind of topic. So this was a topic on textile, as we were in a full uh, pandemic uh, mode, and we thought that I saw textile as one of the most adaptive materials, adaptive materials. So we can, you know, students can work from anywhere. Um, um, so that is an, 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 an material that is very much bound to the history of architecture. If you um, uh, has read uh, Gottfried Semper, for instance, on the origins of, uh, of architecture, textile is, uh, is there uh, key. And the outcome of this uh, uh, studios is always uh, model-based, uh, very large models. We work in a, in a very odd scale, one is 15. It's basically the, the, the biggest we can work uh, to have the most uh, material uh, performance. 
Um, <clears throat> We, uh, I show you two semesters. Uh, one is uh, called uh, Sites. Um, this was taking place in Kyushu Island, which is a southern island of uh, Japan, uh, a volcanic island. Um, and we worked with, let's say, the gestures of a volcanic landscape. So uh, the, of, a, of a landscape that is um, in, in, in geological terms, super fast moving and super fast changing. Uh, and even let's say we can witness that well uh, ourselves. And when we visited the, the island, the volcano was very active. So it was spitting um, ashes and, and fumes uh, all day long. We couldn't uh, go very close to the crater because of its um, uh, very, very strong activity. And that was maybe also um, uh, the main the main interest to be in a landscape that is very much uh, bound to um, to change and how to work with that how can we use this phenomena let's say in in, in working with uh, with uh, architecture um, um, for that one of the key um, um, sources uh, was uh, Michael Heitze uh, well I don't have to explain to you, who is Michael Heitzer, as we are here in an American context. Uh, but what I find really beautiful is what, what Michael Heitzer explained when he bought a property in Nevada, uh, that he bought a property uh, purely for its material reservoir, so that all the raw materials that are basically there were at his um, were, were at his availability. He could just source them directly and work with them uh, um, to produce the, the work with. Um, and I thought that's very, a very beautiful understanding in the sense that when we talk about sites, when we talk about um, a place, the place for our architecture is that we always talk about at least two places because we also need to source our building materials. And how can the sourcing of material and the construction that we then construct most of the time at another place, uh, how can these be, um, be linked? And that was uh, one of the underlying questions in this uh, development of site. So here you see a few of the uh, photos of the trip we did of the, um, of the landscape, uh, the onsens, the, the the, the very strong min mineral presence in this onsens or in this clay baths. Um, here we see um, sulfur, uh, an old sulfur quarry, um, and um, a limolite, a very iron rich uh, clay soil um, here up close. Um, we have always, uh, uh, we invite a lot of experts. This were a Japanese uh, professor that explained us the, the, the chemistry behind what we were looking at. Um, and in Beppu here on the, on the left, uh, cooking uh, based on the thermal activities. So the, 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 the hot water that is used, the hot steam that is used directly to cook with. And you see the beautiful century old uh, deposits of uh, minerals that have set in this kitchen over time. Uh, research, of course, on the volcanic activities on the Asosan, um, but also the so let's say our our more ancient relationships with the landscape. We went to a, um, in a Buddhist temple where they worship uh, certain uh, rocks and mountains, um, and uh, a very recent went landslide that uh, that caught our way. And um, here's a, a project by Anna, uh, who uses the water uh, um, that comes from the from the, um, the hot springs uh, by 120 degrees Celsius. Um, sorry, I don't know what's what it is in Fahrenheit, but very hot cooking uh, cooking water, let's say. And how this in ancient techniques was used to to let it drip over bamboo mass to cool down and use for different uses in the in the thermal baths. And she made a kind of uh, research in how to lead that water not over the traditional bamboo but over a kind of a membrane um, that could be the roof of a, of a place a kind of textile shaped roof 
And through this roof, a strategic point would rip down and would create different kind of um, temperatures in the baths that were um, underneath it. Another project is, I go very fast through them just to give you a, a kind of understanding how we, how we work in these things. Um, Joel, who worked with the sedimentation, as I showed you in the, in the old kitchen in, uh, in Beppu, and how um, in an architecture, this could use as a kind of time recording, as a kind of patination uh, that sets quite quick and in a, in a, in a, in a few uh, months would result in a, in a, in a kind of heavy um, uh, uh, mineral setting, let's say, on its, on its uh, structure. Um, and another student, Sandra, who worked with the, the, the tide differences in um, the seasonal tide differences, let's say, in a, in a, in a hot spring, uh, a very iron rich, uh, as you can see um, uh, by, the, by the colors of the red. I think this is called the, the, the spring of hell, I think, because of its um, high temperature and its red uh, uh, color. And see, um, uh, nowadays these hot springs are tourist attractions, so they are very much controlled and the, the overflow, the natural overflow, uh, seasonal overflow is being um, uh, controlled by irrigation uh, channels. And she proposes to have a more natural flow where this, this overflow in certain seasons takes a larger area around the, um, the, the hot spring. Um, and then dries up again, and in this way creates a kind of sedimentation and a coloring pattern over time um, that we could witness uh, as such. And in this in this approach, what I what I what I very much like in this approach to take certain material conditions and 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 and, and their and the conditions also of their place is that we can have a very interdisciplinary approach to this. So besides the architects, so in this time we had a memorial of Atelier Bauer with Alex Lehner, a Swiss architect, uh, Anton Gazia Brill from Ensemble Studio. But we also have, um, let's say, uh, a professor in, in geochemistry and petrology, or we have artists, um, or structural engineers, geothermal sciences, etc to have um, a very specialized understanding of the material, um, uh, the materials or the, the kind of condition of materials that we are uh, interested in um, uh, at, at kind of, at our understanding and, and research into it. Um, and not necessarily directly in that sense, an architectural application, but that the architectural application is, or that the possibility of, let's say, how to work with it in architecture is being discovered uh, uh, through our engagement as architects with it. Another project uh, was uh, stone, a very, I would say, very classic uh, building material, uh, where we had three sites. Uh, one of the sites was uh, a nice quarry in uh, Switzerland, in Vals. Uh, and the two other sites were um, uh, the Carrera Mountains in Italy, um, uh, where the Carrera marble is uh, sourced, and um, a site in Jodhpur in India with a, a redstone quarry. So a very distinct size and distinct histories and sp specialisms of quarrying and working uh, the, the stone. Um, and one project was by Arturo, who researched the very large monolithic stone quarrying in uh, ancient uh, Egypt. And here you see uh, an unfinished obelisk, um, which was cut out directly out of the rock in its overall shape. And then uh, um, this one is unfinished as it is still in its original quarrying position, which makes it very beautiful to, to research how um, the, the, the ancient Egyptians have been able to move extremely large sizes of stone. Um, 
and his idea was to work with the marks and the way how stone has to be queried um, to, to produce the, the largest one piece stone uh, work um, he could imagine. Um, and that dealt with the fact of the diamond wiring, uh, diamond wire cutting uh, in three dimensions. So to be able also to hollow out in a way this one piece of stone to re re reduce uh, weight um, and directly define with that hollowing out uh, a kind of uh, spatial condition for the architecture. And another one, uh, a couple of students, a, a duo, worked on scagliola, which is an ancient um, Italian technique about mimicking stone, uh, not by painting it, but really by mixing um, pigments in mineral, uh, often gypsum lime-based uh, material, um, that then is carefully arranged, that it looks like stone. And the beauty of it is that you're not bound to a certain dimension of stone uh, that comes for querying. So you can make a stone that is endlessly big in a way, and that continues as one one large drawing, uh, one spatial drawing uh, through space. This, uh, in short, as an introduction to what we do, uh, what I do as a professor in the, in the teaching. Um, and now I will explain a bit how this works in my own, uh, in my own practice. When I started off um, in 2009, uh, which was like five years after my graduation in, uh, in architecture. I, um, um, after I graduated, I worked for uh, these five years for an artist, uh, mainly with the reason that I actually didn't want to become an architect, but I thought I would, I would be better off as an, uh, as an artist. <clears throat> and one day I found out in a conversation with the artist I was working for, that he said, it's fine to become an artist, but you should realize no one is, um, is asking you this. You know, it's, you know, there is no, there's no question for this. You, 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 you could just start, um, which made me rethink my relationship actually with architecture and what I could consider that architecture could be that became um, the main question um, and that I, I called for a long time I call that a possible architecture because I was studying I was looking into processes or let's say ways of how um, art was uh, how how artists would start a work how artists would um, what was the the leading processes in defining their works. Uh, rather, I was much more interested in that than in, in the outcome of the, of the work itself as, the, as, a, as a final end result. Um, and one of these things was uh, chance uh, that I discovered in artists uh, from the Dadaist period um, uh, amongst uh, uh, Jean Arp, uh, for instance. Um, so I started making these drawings, this kind of pencil drawings, this uh, very, you know, these droodles you make uh, when you're having a phone call or when you are in a, in a boring lecture. Um, you know, you, you, they are unconscious drawings in a way they do not directly depict something. And for me, I was very much interested in these kind of drawings uh, to discover them as, as almost directly as a kind of plan for architecture without having um, a program or any other definition uh, to define a plan with. So here you see, I was filling in one of these drawings um, uh, as a plan for a, for a small house. Um, and these drawings were also done in, in a variety of ways, inkblot drawings, as you can see here, drawings that are made basically within a few seconds with a big brush on paper. Uh, repetitively made hundreds of these kind of drawings. Um, and then I could, I could discover within it um, an architecture. 
Um, as you can saw here, uh, the plan, uh, this is the model of that plan. So it's a small tower uh, stacked, stacked on top of each other. And for me, the relationships, they are, the, the, the drawing would uh, enable to discover as a space, the spatial relationships within, um, within its plan, but also between the, in, the, the inside and the outside. Um, were, were, let's say, were a method of dis discovering uh, possibilities rather than I had preconceived ideas on what this relationship should be about. And that for me was um, very much a joy as the process of working um, would, would be, let's say, taking a journey without knowing where you where your destiny is no and, and that is a very for me it was a very liberating a very exciting process um and here you see some of these things uh, most of my projects at that time were either art co commissions within art institutes so there was anyways uh, a lot of freedom to take in the way in what would be made out of it this is um the interior of a temporary um, exhibition space. And then I had uh, a, a first com commission or it was it started off as a competition, um, which was um, a competition for a, a museum uh, for an UNESCO heritage uh, site in the Netherlands, an old defense fortress uh, of the 18th, 19th century. Um, and they gave me this beautiful map of a part of this fortress where they had scheduled uh, the new museum with an eroded landscape, with a landscape that was not its original state, but its current state of nature that has taken over and has formed uh, and eroded uh, um, uh, ground bodies. And I thought it would be interesting to take the drawing of that landscape literally as the blueprint for the architecture. So here you see the, see the, 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 the landscape view uh, as it is a building that is built under the ground, uh, the same way as the, the fortress is built uh, under the ground. So we see here just the two courtyards, but you see how, how the lines of the, the architecture are, are, are literally defined by the, the height line drawing which is of course an annotation way of drawing a landscape, um, but um, nevertheless one-to-one um, -one in, um, in its relationship. So I would just copy uh, the lines. And then the museum, as you can see on, on the right, is, a, is this rectangular volume uh, that on one corner attaches to the existing fortress and captures uh, under the ground all the height lines that we see uh, above the ground. So all the different curvatures of the walls um, are formed actually by the, by the landscape drawing. And what happens with that kind of approach is that there is an, an architecture that here you see the two uh, walls of the, 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 the enclosing walls of the two courtyards is an, arch uh, an architecture that very much embeds itself within its landscape. Um, the high differences are small high differences in the Netherlands, but nevertheless significant for the Netherlands. Um, and where the landscape goes up, uh, literally the, the, the architecture follows it. Um, and then there is a central courtyard that has um, a large, uh, very large uh, architectural model of a, of a part of the, of the Dutch landscape with its rivers and dikes and um, polders um, and shows the, the way how the defense mechanism uh, used to work. Um, and the architecture is in um, uh, our spaces uh, uh, under the ground with windows to these courtyards um, that have everywhere a, a different curvature, uh, different curvatures of the walls um from um, um, uh, and everything follows basically that that curvature so the windows the glass in it everything is is morphed to this and and follows as a kind of 
enormous constraints um, the curvatures of this landscape. It was always a, a, a project very easy to explain to all the, everyone involved and extremely difficult uh, to make um, since uh, there's no system, system in it. There's no engineering uh, thought be behind it. It's purely following the gesture of the drawing from the landscape as its only constraint, but also it's, 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 it's constraint uh, throughout. And the beauty of it is that the light to all these different curvatures falls differently inside the spaces and is ever changing, um, as we can see here. And that when you walk under, when you walk in this museum and you're under the ground, you have all this kind of strange corners as a kind of fragments, puzzle pieces in a way that uh, I, um, link one space to the other. And when I was, when we were constructing this building, this was for me also the first time I had a full construction under my um, supervision and my responsibility. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a client that, that believed in that, that I, I should do that. And I was also my, my, my engineering interest to, to think this project throughout. Um, it's all casted uh, on site uh, in concrete um, um, without any dilatations because um, uh, of the, um, uh, um, the, 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 the heritage, the, the um, archaeological heritage, uh, because the site was also an archaeological heritage site, so we could not make any pole foundations, so we need to make one big massive building that would lay by itself on the ground, um, which made it very, very complicated. And then there was a formwork, of course, that had the, had to follow the curvatures of the landscape everywhere uh, uh, specifically. So um, that was quite a tour de force to make. But what for me, the most interesting part of the construction was that I had carefully traced this form and had drawn this in, in all the, on the building construction drawings. But when we cast concrete, what we actually are building, what we actually are constructing is the formwork. Um, and that the formwork leaves, um, defines in a way with its imprint, the, the, the concrete. And so the concrete is a, is a fluid material uh, when we cast it and, and sets and hardens. And in that process, we need to contain it. So we contain it with a formwork. And um, that formwork became my interest and also that the casting off is a, is a, is a process. It's not something uh, what we draw in architecture school as something that is fixed and, and defined and uh, more or less shows a certain kind of end image of it, <clears throat> but that actually it's a process in which we can intervene a lot um, as architects during a process of making and how this intervention can be uh, used and, and, and uh, to, throughout um, and, and can be um, uh, um, of a potential to define also the architecture. Um, for that, one of the, the uh, <coughs> no, actually the first project I did in Bahrain um, was an extension of an old post office um, that had to be um, um, rehabilitated, uh, renovated, and also extended to uh, uh, stay as, a, as the main post office in Bahrain. And what I did with that extension was to, um, after the casting of the concrete, to let it be hand chiseled um, throughout um, so that we don't, we have in a way a very lengthy process of working on the, on the building itself rather than on something that was defined by a drawing uh, that, that interested uh, me. So the building um, and the hand chiseling is, is, a, 
a very simple but a very laborious act. So basically, it is a small um, pickle and a small hammer, and then you tap into the concrete step by step by step. So that took um, a few months um, to get this kind of pattern. Um, and I was, I was mainly interested in it uh, besides the, the, the beauty of the, of the surface it creates, uh, that a, a process of working in a way is recorded in the architecture and is, is made visible in the architecture. And that kind of understanding that, that let's say what is produced, what, what is a, a process of making and what is produced at the place is something that we, um, that I'm exploring um, at large um, and how, let's say also the, the, how we can, interlink the sourcing of material, the construction at the place to construct a building, how these things can be uh, interwoven. Here you see uh, on the left, um, uh, the Turek Mountains, which is the, the, the base, let's say, of the valleys uh, that are the region of um, Riyadh, of the capital of Saudi Arabia, where we do now a project as I will end my talk with, I will show you a bit of this, uh, where we are now. And you see here uh, uh, a sand um, a site just of plain sand, uh, often a building site looks at the start, uh, looks uh, um, like this. Um, and for me, the interest is how this construction at the place uh, by taking its material that is already um, uh, that is already there. Um, we see here in Bahrain, this is a burial mound on the left side. Um, this is of the Dilmun period. So, so this is a few thousand years before Christ. So these are like 5,000 year old um, erections by um, the Dilmun civilization as a way to uh, bury their ancestors. Um, and the beauty is that it is basically material taken from its place and, and remodeled and placed in a different form to make this kind of mount of material. Um, and on the other photo, on the aerial photo, I took one of my first visits to Bahrain. I took from the airplane. This is land reclamation on coral, coral banks, um, which is basically taking sand from the sea bottom and put it on top to create new land. And both are constructions that you could say deal directly with the, the material presence and its possibility to construct on the, on the same place. Um, another, for me, very important uh, source is uh, Petra. This is in Jordan. Um, these are also grave tombs that are made by the Nabataeans. Uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, roughly. Um, and these are photos taken by Bas Prince, a photographer that I uh, have been collaborating a lot with. Um, and what I find very beautiful is that the architecture here is not so much of a construction, but more like a sculptural act. So it's material taken out of, it's sculpted out of the mountain. So the mountain here is the direct material presence, a material reservoir that is sculpted um, uh, by hooning, by cutting out uh, to define the architecture with, with beautiful interior spaces, as you can see here, where we can see the, the coloring of the stone uh, much more strongly. Very simple, basic kind of um, uh, spaces. Um, and then in the 2000 years, how that architecture has been eroded again because of the soft limestone rock um, so you see this kind of variations between natural form and artificial form, man-made form, without being able to draw a very clear division line uh, between these two. And I started working with that kind of 
interest. And this was the first project I did already in 2011 in the Netherlands, where I started casting it directly on the ground uh, puddles of um, uh, concrete, uh, pigmented concrete, that then are formed by its small topography of that, uh, of that landscape. So that form is not defined at all by me, but by the landscape and, um, and directly within a material. So without any translation through drawings as I had done in the past, but that matter, that matter is formed by another matter in a way. Yeah? That it is a cast of one material on another material. Um, and this is a method that we use now we are exploring quite a lot through, through our different projects and in different um, uh, materials. Um, um, and my interest in the, one of the things that I find very, um, uh, that appeals to me is that we describe often for these projects um, a method of casting. Uh, rather than we make a, a, a precise drawing of what the elements or the, 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 the result should be like. So the result is often given out in a way to the contractor and his team, um, um, and therefore it creates uh, also quite a bit of unexpected results. Um, and it is a method that is very efficient in a way because we cast these things directly on the on the building site um, that's is one of the things that I very much like of being here in Bahrain that we have we have no vegetation on the ground we have the, the mineral presence I mean in Texas you also have that that you have this kind of direct bare mineral presence as a landscape uh, in which we can, uh, uh, which I can directly work. So we work with hardly no formwork, uh, very minimal formwork, and the, and the material is directly produced on it. Um, and then my first test with it were these models, which are called Batra. Uh, Batra is uh, related to Petra, is um, uh, Arabic for hewning, for cutting, for cutting out of rock. Um, and you see here that you have then a recording of the rough side of the landscape side with the traces of the digging, um, with the traces that the sand and the different heights leaves as an imprint in it. Um, and we see uh, the pouring side. So we see a material that has solidified um, and uh, is casted over time. Um, and you have uh, a perimeter that is not rectangular, but you have something that is more or less freely formed. So you have this kind of all this formal formal gestures in a way to be able to work with, uh, um, rather than you have something that is um, a clearly defined form, for instance, in a plan or something like that. So these are things that are produced without any drawing, they're produced by a, a definition of how much material, um, more or less a size, etc., and that's it. Um, here you see a first kind of architecture that I formed with a model with it. Um, uh, again, a photo by a bus pincer. Um, and here we do that. Um, uh, we started doing this work in. Um, different materials. Uh, we do the casting in uh, metals, um, mainly in aluminum or aluminum, as you say. Um, also in glass, we do this casting methods. Um, the very interestingly, when you change the material, the, 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 the whole specialism of being able to produce something changes uh, radically. So the method of, of Forming a material in a in a on a on a mineral granular material is this is <clears throat> as an idea the same, but uh, the special the way how to be able to cast 
it uh, creates um, um, all kind of new, of defines all kind of new researches of how that is then uh, possible to do, um, and different specialisms to 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 be to be involved in. For instance, here we see the um, the aluminium aluminium casting that we did which is basically um, always a hollow cast. Everything that is casted in metal is a hollow cast because otherwise you would have an enormous mass of material that would be uh, very heavy, uh, but also um, the thermal differences by, by a, such a material, such a body of material to cool down would be uh, um, extreme and would, uh, would crack. Uh, gigantically so you cast always hollow so any sculpture that you see um, or that you have destroyed in the in the in the in the in the recent times are hollow sculptures um, if you knock on them uh, you you hear an, um, a hollow sound um, and therefore that you need to make two molds an inner and an outer molds um, and the molds are um, for larger castings always uh, sound uh, uh, sand that is chemically bound together or in the past would have been bound together with any kind of sticky material of, from sugar molasses I saw in India to, to um, uh, clay kind of grounds or, or these kind of things. But the principle is always that it is a, the mold is a, it's a sand based and that you, after the casting you can break it and you open up and then you have the the the, the metal, um, the the the, uh, the the sculpture um, that you want to take out. So there is a, this kind of and and what we did was we use sand also as a base to form its base form with. So you have this kind of double doubling in the in the sand uh, presence. And here you see on the right uh, an aluminium cast that we made as shutters for um, windows and, and, the, and the main door of a building, uh, the green corner building here in Bahrain. Uh, and here you see another one in, in glass um, that we ha uh, are working with, I'll show you in a, in a bit. Um, and by also by the material differences, also the performances, of course, are uh, uh, very different. Um, This is the um, entrance door of that green corner building I was referring to. Um, and since the aluminium cast of the metal cast in general is a hollow cast, you will have the, let's say, the print of the landscape, uh, the print of the sand as a positive form in it, but also you have its hollow form. So you have the negative of that landscape on the other sides um, of it. Um, uh, and we use that in a way that when you approach this building, you approach the hollowness, the negative of it um, as, the, um, as the entrance uh, door. And on the right side, you see the shutters because this is a building um, where its purpose is to store art in and to do art restoration for paperworks. Um, since that is a very light, it's very sensitive for light. We made these shutters uh, in front of the windows that you can close and in a way block out uh, the light. And now I will explain a bit about the building, but maybe, oh yeah, sorry, I, I, I wanted to show you also this, is that what we, what we define as formwork is where an element in a way stops, yeah, so where the, the perimeter is. Um, which then in a three-dimensional material form becomes a kind of section of, of it. Uh, uh, um, and, and for me, in this kind of cast, really evokes even more strongly the, the, the idea of um, a fragment of a landscape. 
but for me these are real fragments of landscapes as they are taken you know as directly as formed by an imprint of the of a part of of landscape but they are also like miniature landscapes like models of landscapes you can easily imagine uh, 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 mountains and valleys um, on this uh, aluminium cast that you see here. But these um, sites, they also help because they are the, the ones that are have a precise uh, definition. And in that sense, we can easily stack them. So this is the site of this green corner building. Uh, it's a four-story building um, where we use the concrete as a as a complete, as a structural material as well. So that is basically its main structure um, 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 that, that defines and, and holds up uh, the building. Um, and here we see it here with a bit more distance. And all these concrete elements are directly casted next to it uh, on, the, on the building site itself. And then uh, after it's cured, placed into the building. And also the floor slabs uh, are done in the in the same uh, way, um, and in that sense we have all different times and all different acts of moving around that that, that sand in on the building site as a, as a recording of its uh, of its own process of construction. Uh, so we 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 see all its variations. And if you look at every single element, some elements uh, might be more beautiful than other elements. Some are more strongly pronounced, some are very more flat. Um, but that's, the, that's in a way the joy of it, that there is no repetition in it, but that every element in that, in, by the definition of making is, um, is different. Uh, you see also here on the ground floor and the on the left picture the the, the entrance door that is uh, open in this photo. Um, and inside, uh, the floor slabs, as I said, are also casted on the ground, so it gives this kind of ceiling. Um, uh, because at the ceiling we don't mind if it has a relief, and the floor then is again the top of that that is a, a flat a concrete. And you see here the, the, the window shutters um, that we can slide in front of the windows to block out uh, the light. And this is the building uh, in full uh, facade. Uh, it's very, it was, <clears throat> it sounds simple uh, to construct, but for the, the structural engineering um, uh, was quite a complicated, um, uh, question, because in a way, as an engineer, you don't want to deal with uncertainty. And here there was a big uncertainty in the sense that we do not know how the mass distribution is per element. And therefore, um, we have difficulties in calculating um, how the forces um, will develop, um, how we have to reinforce um, with steel uh, these elements. So we came to certain kind of rules, how to define, how to deal with the uncertainty in the, in the, in the structural engineering. One of these rules was that we, that we do not define the mass distribution, but we define the total mass, for instance. So a total amount of concrete uh, for a certain size of elements. Uh, it was, was one of the things how to, um, how, how to incorporate, let's say, uh, this kind of uncertainty. And I work with all of these projects uh, um, with, uh, with one structural engineer, which is called Mario Monotti, Swiss engineer, um, um, that we have a lot of joy in, in, in finding out, um, in a way, new principles for structural calculations um, um, uh, because of the, of the nature of... Um, of the of the uh, the building design of the architecture. Um, this to show you another project with this, a similar way, but where we actually used the net the, the the natural material as a border rather than as a surface. Um, uh, so we have in a way when you go to a stone quarry and the and the blocks are cut. Um, what I find always really beautiful is 
that we still have this natural perimeter or when you slice uh, a tree trunk in part, uh, you would have this natural perimeter that George Nakashima used so beautifully in his furniture. Um, we use just, we basically have a, a flat base um, formwork, uh, a table in which we just put sand to the sides to define the ends of it. And that are the, the building elements of uh, a souk, which is a kind of traditional shopping mall, you could say, yeah? uh, an uh, an uh, Arab uh, Middle East. And uh, uh, in the Middle East, we call that a, a souk, this kind of traditional shopping streets. Um, that we can then, that we have the, we use this kind of differences in the elements to define uh, the architecture with. And these are things that we didn't know, you know, all of these forms are defined on the building site um, itself. So you can see here. And this is a new building in a bigger part that we did the, the, the renovation or the rehabilitation of. So this basically restructures or completes uh, the, 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 the old streets uh, uh, morphology of the of this area, um, and here you see it together with uh, the old shops. Um, the, the new building will, are also shops, but at the time of the photographs, uh, they were not uh, yet taken. So now we have on both sides we have the the offerings uh, available. <clears throat> and the last. Uh, a uh, project that I wanted to show you to conclude with is, an, is a new art institute that we are um, constructing in uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, um, where we use this kind of technique to form a glass with, uh, by casting a glass. I think 90% of the world production of glass is float glass. Uh, float glass is... Um, uh, produced uh, anywhere in the world, um, uh, also in the US, you have a large uh, float glass factories. Float glass is on a on a on a tin bath. Uh, it's a very fast production method of glass, but therefore glass you can only get it in a maximum thickness of like two and a half centimeter, which is more or less one inch, I would say. Um, that's the thickness of glass in a way, what you can get. Uh, if you want to have thicker, you need to cast glass, uh, which means that you melt grains of glass in a formwork and then uh, uh, let it cure very slowly over time because you need to, um, if, you, if, you, if you cool down glass too fast, it will completely crack eh, with all the tensions that will develop in it. So you, you do it very slowly. And for already for like a 12 centimeter, so what is that? Like four or five inches thick glass piece. It would take around five weeks in an oven to cool down. Um, and it, uh, the, the thicker it goes, the more exponential uh, the, the the cooling down period in an oven is. And it really means the piece stays within an oven and com computerized cooling down happens within that oven. I don't know if you ever saw a work by the artist Ronnie Horn that made his big glass sculptures. I think these glass sculptures, which are, can be like a meter thick, uh, probably have been in an oven for like five, six months uh, to, cool, uh, to cool down. So to understand a little bit, the the absolute intensity of what it is to work with glass um, but what is also really beautiful is one of the, our oldest materials uh, we can also observe uh, obsidian stone for instance which is a natural glass that we can find in nature and um, we use that um, we use the casting of glass uh, again, in a kind of granular material on which we cast it. Um, and that granular material has 
um, as an effect that the glass piece becomes not transparent anymore, but becomes a, a kind of diffracted surface and it affects the light in it. So it's, it's, it, uh, the light doesn't go st straight through in a way to a flat glass plane, but diffuses in the glass plane. And that's exactly what, uh, what I want to use in the conditions of an art institute, where we have a um, space that is um, all around uh, glass, um, uh, but it's in a way like um, a light machine where um, the different times of a day, the different conditions of the lights, the way how the lights, uh, from which direction the light comes, the way how um, the environment is illuminated, all will um, work as a kind of subdued wall in a way of, uh, of the, uh, of the exhibition space, which I think for um, contemporary art is a very um, specific condition, a very exciting condition uh, to work with uh, for sculpture, for performances, etc. And then when there is the need of to block it off, uh, there are uh, textile screens that can be closed to, uh, to control the light uh, even more. Um, and that building is built um, in uh, the escarpment of a wadi, as I explained uh, when I showed you the Tuwik Mountains. Um, uh, the wadi is a kind of dry river valley um, with an escarpment of around at the place where we work of 30 meters height that we, that we make a cut out in a kind of Michael Heiter double negative cutout in the landscape to provide space for this building. And this building is then freestanding within this excavation um, with the idea that it gives shade, uh, partly shade to the building. It gives also, it shows very strongly its mineral presence in a way of what we are working on the site. And that is also what we use as directly as an imprint to form um, uh, the glass um, width that we construct this, um, this building with. Um, the nice thing also what I, I didn't explain is that because we cast glass in this kind of thicknesses, we can use it uh, structurally. Uh, so the, the glass um, um, will carry this whole glass facade will will carry itself um, um, over the whole uh, length of the facade. And here you see a last photo how that building is sticking within the wadi. On top of it will be um, a city uh, uh, development, which is called uh, Misk uh, City, uh, which is all about. Um, a development about educational institutes and a cultural institutes. And you see the, the on the right, the, the bottom of the Wadi with the desert trees and the, and the end of the museum. And with that, I wanted to end my presentation for this evening or for, for your mornings. And, uh... Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think maybe uh, uh, if you have time, uh, yes. first of all, uh, this, uh, it's going to take a few minutes for students who have not seen your work for them to unblow their minds a little bit in order to get questions ready. But maybe if you could unshare and we could uh, turn faces on yeah. for, for people yeah. in, the, in the Zoom talk. Here we are. So, so those of you who are in the Zoom talk, I'd really be grateful if you would uh, at least turn your turn your uh, 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 screens on and then let's just do a kind of virtual round of applause here it would be very sweet so on uh, uh, I think let's uh, let me open this I have obviously have my own questions but let's open this up to questions and then uh, I'll try to manage uh, Ryan if you have questions coming in from the live stream that'd be really great uh, but uh, let's uh, open this up to questions 
Uh, Dana. Hello. Good afternoon or good evening. Um, I would like to, to ask one question, uh, two questions, in fact. Starting with the last project in KSA, um, you, is it, wasn't there a problem that the project was made out of glass in a climate like uh, Saudi Arabia? Um, okay, it's, it's a very beautiful project. And coming from an area here, we're in Lebanon, and um, 100 days of sunshine, and we have when we have a project like that in uh, with glass, it's kind of problematic. Well, that's my first question. Um, the should I ask the second one now? Sure, yes. Okay, the second one was when you showed us the projects that are carved in the stone, like Petra and stuff, and you showed you focused on the stone thing. I thought that you were focusing on, like, say, like um, the carving of the stone. Of course, we're not going to go back to the idea of Petra going back and carving a project within the stone and climbing in, in, in a mountain. But I thought that you're going to focus on, let's say, like quarrying from the nearby sites. Like, for example, in KSA, they've got these beautiful mountains of granite or something and building projects. The idea of your concrete is amazing. It's beautiful. It's the first time I've seen something like this. But you're kind of mimicking stone in order to create concrete that's carved out of, out of uh, real life stone. The problem with that is actually sustainability carbon emissions, the carbon footprint, and all of that. Have you really thought about the sustainable factor of your design, other than the design factor, which is, it's, okay, design and this thing is very nice, but would if you had really quarried from the, the, the stones available in the, in the area, would it have been better? Thank you. And yeah, I so no, I, thank you, Dana. Um, so the, both questions deal with the concern also of sustainability, you know, and, and, uh, and if we do something um, uh, mindfully in that sense. Um, let's say um, I live now also for eight years in this region. I'm living in the neighboring country of uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and although the conditions are quite different in Bahrain from Saudi, um, but the, the conditions of light and temperature are very similar. And I find what I find really, what I want to do with this museum is that the, the specific conditions uh, that we can work with, with the intensity of light, uh, to use them, you know, not to block them out, but to, to, to use that in this building. Um, and how did we overcome the, 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 the negative consequences of it that it also generates a lot of heat is the fact that the building has a double facade. So there is an inner glass facade as there is an outer glass facade, um, which helps to evacuate a lot of the heat because the heat gets actually trapped behind the first glass facades. Um, and naturally by chimney effects, is ev evacuated from the building. And another aspect of it is that we place it within, uh, partly within an excavation, um, which also uh, reduces the heat loads. So it, at the end, we have even, we, had, we have less um, heat loads to deal with than if we would have made it um, a, full, a full normal glass uh, facade uh, building. So, so we, it's definitely of our concern, but um, I think with this, with these kind of solutions, we have found smart solutions in a way uh, to filter out the problem of the heat, but to work with the light uh, that I think um, uh, for me is essential to use in the, in a kind of specific place as we are, I, I, um, working here. Um, the idea of the stone, I, actually for the for the, um, the souk building I showed you, the original, the, the first idea was to make a building in, nat in natural stone. And um, I started looking in the region and ended up in Egypt, 
uh, um, as a as a place where we build even a one to one mock up of uh, of this soup building fully in stone, uh, completely structural uh, stone, including its um, roofs. Um, but then I started to become very unhappy with the fact that we have to transport all of this stone from Egypt uh, to Bahrain and uh, somehow didn't feel right to me to import a material that maybe looks very natural, is very, um, is a lot of, it would take an enormous amount of transport to be able to, to, to bring here. Um, for that same reason, um, I look also at wood architecture in regions where there's actually not much wood as a supply, uh, uh, as something that is, you know, or in mud, in um, rent earth building where we actually do not even have clay uh, present in the in the in the in the uh, in the site. It's, it's these things. They look. They look. Um, uh, they might look correct, um, but are not so correct if you consider where you know, um, where the building is uh, taking place. So in Bahrain, since it is a, it's a very small country, it has very limited amount of uh, resources. Um, one of the resources is aluminum or aluminum, since we have here uh, one of the largest aluminum smelters in the world. Um, so that is a material that I started working with as a local, as a local material uh, that is here. And the other one is, uh, is concrete. And concrete, yes, for sure, is not ideal. Um, and luckily at the ETH, there's um, uh, interesting research developing in, uh, in, in uh, biopolymers uh, as a new binder uh, to replace a cement. But the reality is not there yet. Um, but if you take a, a, a concrete construction, um, up to 40 to 45% is in uh, transport and form work. Um, and that we have dramatically reduced by the, by the, by the casting techniques. So it's maybe not 100% correct, but on the other hand, it uh, improves a lot on um, um, the elimination of uh, form work. Um, uh, what we have done. That's another research, for instance, that has, has been done in our university as well, is how can we rethink um, the idea of form work? Um, uh, not in my chair, uh, but in the chair of uh, Kamocha Köhler, they are doing research in very quick setting concrete, for instance, um, um, as a way how to reduce the, um, all the waste and energy that is put in, in, in form work itself. Uh, so that's another aspect um, um, of it, Anna. And I thank you for this question. I, I know it's a question you must get very often and, and uh, I, I appreciate it. I'm gonna, before I let Charlie ask this question, I'm gonna ask another question because one of the things, this question yeah. must come up to you all the time, right? You speak everywhere around yeah. the world. And the automatic response yeah. is con concrete bad, therefore. But the interesting issue that I wanted to ask you about was about the desire to achieve mass, right? So like, like you, it's, it's this very strange thing that you see around the world happening in with these very interesting architects who moved away from the idea of lightness to the idea of yep. mass. And, and there's very few ways to achieve these kinds of substantial masses. And you spoke of the desire to do it several times, right? It's just this thing that you want to get, right? And it's, it's one of these things that 30 years from now, historians will go, yes, the reason all these architects wanted to achieve mass was, and then they'll give an explanation. And, but I'm wondering if you yourself could speak briefly about this desire from, for, 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 for an almost monumental uh, uh, kind of a, a monolithic uh, mass, which is which hasn't been seen in architecture for many many years. Yeah, I think I think let's say in in our modern modern times, we were also able to build light and transparent because we were heavily relying on the systems 
that would uh, support uh, this, you know, the climate systems that would support this, etc. Yeah? So we we would we could make any kind of climate condition within a building, uh, uh, despite what what we the kind of membrane or the definition of this building, um, and therefore we were able to do these things. Um, before that, of course, we were relying on a very different kind of um, uh, conditions of living and conditions of space. Uh, we would, uh, you know, I, I grew up in old houses as a child where it would always be freezing cold in the winter, um, but very nice in the summer because it would still be cold kind of <laughs> inside of this <laughs> heavy <laughs> stone houses. Um, what what we what I try I try with the buildings that we make um, to 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 simplify in a way um, the systems that we need to put in place to make it uh, uh, to make it work. So I look to something that makes it a, that keeps a kind of directness and a kind of maybe something that is more archaic in the sense of uh, the understanding of it. Um, and the mass, the thickness of things have actually had beneficial uh, uh, um, properties in, in, the, in, the, in the climate conditions I'm working in here. Uh, since we have never, um, it never freezes here and we have the, the lowest temperature that we have here is around uh, 18, 20 degrees Celsius in the winter. And we have a lot of heat that we need to, uh, to, to work with. And for that, um, uh, we need to insulate our, our, our roofs really well uh, against sun loads. We need to minimize the amount of uh, openings and all of these things. But the mass, the, 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 the the thickness of the the of the, the the walls of the concrete have actually a very positive um, uh, effect to it. Um, so that um, that works in in our our benefit. But why why do I not like a thin <laughs> thin architecture? I think I like I. It's not. It's actually not about not liking thin. It's about really, really liking thick. You know that, thick. that, that heavy. That, that, <laughs> heavy. And it's kind yes. of funny because you see it all of a sudden, right? In, in, in a few architects who are, who are interested in this, in this kind of heaviness, and I, I, I completely appreciate the environmental justifications. So I, I, I'm totally on board with that. But but there's something yeah. else at work. Right? There's some. There's a kind of monumentalism that, and a kind of uh, that 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 seems like also. A desire that that uh, I mean yeah. it may not be able, able it may not be a thing that you're able to say what it is, but I just wondered if you would venture into into even kind of guessing. No, it, it has it has to do with the 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 atmosphere, no, the kind of feeling it uh, it uh, it breeds. For me, it's very it's it's very important to have this process visible, you know, but also the imagination that it evokes, that, that is all this, this reliefs that they are uh, open for readings in a way. For me, they are like, when I showed you the inkblot drawings at the start of my, my, my practice, they were already like this kind of Rorschach drawings uh, that, that evoke imagination, you know, that uh, they do not, it's, it's form, it's material, but it, um, it do not directly represent something or depict something. And for me, that becomes in the, in working within the, in a material mass, like how, so how I can observe a rock um, is very much, uh, present there, and I think that kind of this kind of presence of of the real presence of material in all its mass and its 
it's um, yeah. How do we say the 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 the, 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 the real what I say with the presence is that it really is it's there, but you have um, it still leaves open for understanding. No, it still, it still leaves open for for you, your way of reading it or your kind of understanding what we are looking at. And for me, that's something very um to for me for something very to the base of things no to the base of um, of how we um how we as humans work no or uh, sure so i yeah it's it's difficult to to maybe express <laughs> well, let, me, let me ask you so charlie charlie charlie, for that. <laughs> charlie charlie i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna Charlie has a question here. Charlie's my student, so I'm going to override. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> I want to ask a follow-up question. So you were talking about the kind of process and then the idea that when you saw the building, you saw the process. But I remember when I first saw your souk building, right, where, so in theory, the process is that the edges come up against the casting material. And that's yeah. what you see. But what I first saw was a building that had been destroyed, right? Like, like the, the reading of it was... That there were that there were that it was that there were pieces that were broken, and I wondered yeah. about this kind of iconographic, and that was actually quite shocking to me because I mean obviously Bahrain is one place, but but, but this question of this kind of destroyed cities or this kind of destroyed concrete iconography, that's that is associated with certain parts of the world, certainly associated with images currently of Lebanon, right? Parts of Beirut are just, they're left in, in, in yeah. the images that you see. And I wondered if you had a particular a blowback in uh, with the particular iconography of the souk. Yeah, um, th this kind of form, let's say this whole idea of wanting to build this building in stone uh, initially, came from the historic buildings that are built in stone, but they are built in coral stone, since there were no real uh, stone quarries or very limited stone quarry on this island. So the stone that they used to build with was taken from the sea um, and either sliced in, in small parts, um, never much bigger than uh, a meter in, in, the, in the maximum length, um, or in blocks of coal stone that were kind of uh, cemented uh, together. Um, and if you remove the, if you remove the old plaster layers, you will see this as its uh, base uh, structure. So for me, the, the the interest was how can I build nowadays in stone again? Of course, coral stone is is luckily uh, protected. Right? We cannot uh, take that anymore from the sea. Um, so I started looking around to see how where I can get stone. Um, and one of these places was Oman and the other place was uh, Egypt that I saw uh, possibilities. But when, I, I, when we built with it, it, for me, it really didn't feel at all anymore um, a part of the initial relationship I wanted to build up with, uh, in Bahrain. Um, and this photo I showed you with this cut stone was actually at the quarry in, um, in Egypt where I was working at. Um, so I, I, I took that idea of that the stone, you know, even sliced and, 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 and processed to be built with always has this kind of natural perimeter somehow, a presence or natural form presence. That I took as its base principle for the, for the souk. And Yes, we live here in a region with a lot of um, war, unfortunately, and a lot of um, um, uh, tragic uh, disasters in which we are um, ourselves um, also part of. My family is, uh, my wife is Palestinian. Uh, our children are Palestinian and Dutch. So we, I know really well also the 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 ruined sites, uh, uh, or what you're referring to in Beirut or in Syria, or, 
Um, but I, I never I never looked at it as something that is deteriorated by terror, but something that hovers between natural form and artificial form. For me, that was a lot more of the, the way of understanding it. So that form can be very defined, but then that that line gets diffused or crumbled down or you know or dissolves again. Um, that's what I, I find interesting in it. And that's what I try to show also in the in the in the ruins, let's say, in Petra, um, where you have this natural form taken over, you know, they, yeah, we could also see them as blast holes, but I see them more as nature redefining, you know, or taking over, shaping again uh, matter. Um, and I think it was Robert Smithson that was talking about ruins in reverse, you know, that our, our construction sites are ruins in reverse. So that's kind of ping pong between a construction and what is its ultimate state, you know, and what can what deconstructs again and and re and matter that reforms again. For me, that's the in, that's the the main um, the main uh, interest. You know, let me ask you quickly uh, uh, if you have a few more minutes. We have a few more questions, but I'm 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 cognizant of the fact that it's very late where you are. <laughs> no, it's good, but I think Charlie is uh, wanting to ask a question for some time. Yeah, but, but it's my job to repress yeah. Charlie. Charlie. Yes. <laughs> okay. My question is, I see it's Charlie. Th thanks for the crazy lecture. My, my question is way easier than David's questions. Um, so I really like what you talk about, where you started working for artists. And like for me, art is really about challenging the the preconceived notion and the changing the static quo. And you was talking about, yeah, artists doing all this stuff, but no one really asking the question. So you switch to architecture. I really feel the same way when I was in architecture school. Like in architecture school, we are really encouraging to kind of pushing the boundary, challenging idea. But for some reason, especially in the state, when you move into practice, like everything changed. It's like you need to consider like the budget, the, the, or the building call and the client. So my question is, when you first started your practice before you're known to be the guy that the firm that experiment with crazy concrete form, how do you work with the constraint, work with the kind of friction between all this experimental way to do stuff and like realistic practice? Thank you. Yes. Um, the, the first building, the, the first real building, let's say, what my, my, my architect friends found the real building was the museum I built in the Netherlands. Um, um, and they found it a real building because it had real glass in the windows, let's say. And before that, I was making all this temporary buildings that, that were also in, in within arts context so so there was always this confusion if i would would i would you know um be an architect acting as an, an artist or actually an artist that kind of tries to make also kind of architecture out of it uh, so there was always this confusion and i was i'm happy that i that i insisted that it should actually be understood as architecture and for me the, the my discipline is 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 architecture um, but that I can, that I have also the freedom myself as an architect to define what architecture uh, is, you know, and that I think that freedom you always have wherever you, wherever you are. Um, that you have to work with constraints is also always part of it. Uh, especially the, the, the art commissions I had were this kind of no budget, uh, uh, commissions uh, so it was all what you can find as you know they were built in wood for instance because that was the cheapest sheet material i could find you know and that would be just a way how to um, that would give the definition of the project and and also now 
um, it's not only to define a form that makes the, the project uh, successful or not. It is to, as an architect, to bring all the, um, the different conditions and different constraints uh, together. Uh, one of them is, um, is uh, uh, very present is, is budget, of course. You know, all these projects that I showed you have, have um, uh, despite what people think, because I'm now here in the Middle East, but they have actually moderate, <laughs> they have very moderate budgets. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot lower than uh, what I see in Switzerland, for instance. Huh? It's more like um, an average European building budget that I work with here. So it's 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 not um, the sky is the limit and whatever crazy form I can imagine, uh, but it is about how to con how to concentrate all of that in a certain kind of specific focus and a specific approach that, that I first of all want to convince myself of, you know, what is my own doubt uh, that I'm working with um, and that I look for, um, that let's say as a process of making is, is in a way of, of clearing and, um, doubts or trying to find uh, answers to two things that is never ending of course but it's the driving force um, but also to do that with the clients you know to 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 allow a client to take part of a process where the outcome is in a way um, um, uh, uh, partly unknown not what we are going to 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 uh, do. Um, but that it is the engagement within a process and the arguments for that engagement that are, are, are key for the understanding of it. And that that is the, um, where, the, where, the, where, the, where, the where the collective interest is. And that's what, we, that, uh, that's what I, I work with. Um, I don't have a lot of clients uh, and it's also not a process of it's a very labor intensive process of working what we do so we do um, a few projects at a time you no know, that to to make this uh, just these uh, steps in. you know the um so first of all the First of all, the next time you come to Mexico, let us know because we'll get you to come to Texas. And uh, if I if I'd realized you were going to be in uh, in Mexico, I would have I would have changed this <laughs> online to in person. You know, a, a lot of people have left because at two o'clock here we get studios are really itching to start. But there's a few people left and a few faculty left. And one more question from Dana. So Dana, yep. if you still if uh, 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 Anna, if you still good with another question. I'm sorry, I can't yep. turn on the camera. I have a problem with the net, with the internet. <laughs> okay. And it's not a question. It's just a follow-up on what you said about the war in Lebanon and your reaction regarding his building and the building of Mr. Holtra. Um, Actually, as a Lebanese who has endured the civil war and the other wars, and then when I saw your building that looked like destructed, uh, it was a, actually a surprise because um, I, this is just a com uh, comment. Because usually, um, when we try to to design, we we prefer to run away and to to forget about the war, and we do not want to see it again. But there are a lot of architects that try to keep. They say that we have to keep something as a reminiscence of the war, like we have to remember it. And then when you explained why you did that, I thought that uh, before you explained it, I thought that there was something related to the war in Bahrain, because I really don't know anything about Bahrain, although it's a close country. So for, for me as, a, as Albanese, we, I, mean, I, think, I think usually we, we try to erase any, any symbol of any war um, when, when we want to um, like redesign. It's, I, I'm not saying like we erase double rasa, no. But we don't we don't want to remember it. We don't want to see destructions or anything like that because I don't know the memories are really hard and stuff like that. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 uh, for me there is there is no relationship with uh, 
um, any war. Yeah, I did understand that. I did understand that. It was more of a conceptual huh? thing. Yeah, I just wanted to put that now. No, 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 I wouldn't go. I, I mean, I have many Lebanese friends, uh, also uh, architects uh, amongst uh, Bernard Khoury, for instance. That is yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he, uh, he does very crazy that things. That might have a, have a very different opinion about uh, this relationship. Um, I, um, I have a Lebanese architect working in my studio, but also an architect from Iraq, or I have um, uh, architects from Saudi and, and Bahrain in my studio. Um, we are very, I think there's um, amongst them a very strong awareness no of course where they 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 where of their backgrounds of their cultural backgrounds or where these countries are how they are working or how they are not working uh, the hope for 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 a, for a better for better times no and i strongly hope that one day we are able um, to, to remove the occupation of Israel and finally have a, a free land where, where I also would have a right as a Palestinian to, to, to be part of, because that's simply not possible. And we know that in, in, in Lebanon, it's, uh, it's not much easier. And where it's, it's, it's such a shame for all these countries because they're so incredibly beautiful countries with such a beautiful, strong uh, cultural history. Yeah. Um, but in the work I make, for me, it's not at all about uh, a direct response or, or a direct representation of these things. It has to do a lot more in how we give definition to the things that we form um, and how this definition, um, how we can in a way, how we can relate that to uh, also to nature and to 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 origin of things, and that for me is uh, is much more of a of a driving force. I don't know if you know one of these early works by Jean Arp, which is called uh, Constellation. It's actually these fragmented black pieces of um, what were literally. Um, a, a, a paper. Um, apparently, Jean Arc made his work while he was uh, staying in Zurich. Um, and he, uh, where a lot of data is at that time, uh, during the war state in, um, in Switzerland and in Zurich. And he, um, he was trying to make something, uh, uh, but left frustrated his um, studio and tear the work down and threw it on the floor. And he left for a drink or something and he came back and that kind of destructive act of taking his work apart led to the base of another work. Uh, and that is that work that is, I think it's called Constellation and then something with chance in the title. Um, um, and the, the beauty is that that work does not represent the deconstruction, but represents the ability to see uh, um, something new, no? something else, something unseen. Um, and that is the base of the, of the work, which I find always a very beautiful um, understanding of how we can, um, how, how, how we can produce something that, that we hadn't thought of yet or that we hadn't we had no there were no preconceived ideas um, and for me that is another um, driving force in the work you know how how to build in uh, mechanisms that that lead in the work to something that i also hadn't um, imagined yet um, as such uh, another example I find beautiful in Jean Arp's work is the wood reliefs that he would um, ask carpenters to cut out, um, and the, but there was no drawing to these reliefs. There would be a verbal description by Jean Arp. He would explain 
a certain form he had in mind. And then the carpenter uh, cut out his forms. And of course, there would be in the translations and the imaginations of someone else um, a lot of unexpectedness. And that's exactly what he worked with. Um, and that's and these kind of methods I I I also use and I also incorporate. So for instance, we, we define a way of making something, um, but we do not define precisely uh, its outcome. And that's uh, something that uh, we've just set the rules in a way yes. uh, to work with. And so um, it's a long answer, Dana, but uh, it no, no, touched I, I upon- Thank, thank you for your time. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Anna, you know, thank you again. You know, I, 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 I wanted, I've been trying for a couple of years to get you to come speak with us. I'm so, so glad we had to cancel last year. You have an open invitation if you're in Texas or even if you're heading anywhere in the States to come down here and, and spend time in or let us, let us show you this landscape a little bit. I, I, again, uh, thank you so much for your time. 